Good afternoon. If the uh, room would please come to order. If guests, kindly take your seats. Thank you. So good afternoon. In today's online world, your name, birth date, and mother's maiden name are often used to verify your identity. But in the wake of massive data breaches at Sony and Epsilon, we are now painfully more aware that this very same information can be used just as easily to falsify your identity. The time has come for Congress to take action. And the chair now recognizes herself for an opening statement. With nearly 1.5 billion credit cards now in use in the United States and more and more Americans banking and shopping online, cyber thieves have a treasure chest of opportunities today to get rich quick. Why crack a vault when you can hack a network? The Federal Trade Commission estimates that nearly 9 million Americans fall victim to identity theft every year, costing consumers and businesses billions of dollars annually, and those numbers are growing steadily and alarmingly. In recent years, sophisticated and carefully orchestrated cyber attacks designed to obtain personal information about consumers, especially when it comes to their credit cards, have become one of the fastest growing criminal enterprises here in the U.S. as well as across the world. Just last month, the Justice Department shut down a cyber crime, cyber crime ring believed to be based in Russia, which was, was responsible for the online theft of up to $100 million. The boldness of these attacks and the threat they present to unsuspecting Americans was underscored recently by massive data breaches at Epsilon and Sony. In some ways, Sony has become ground zero in the war to protect consumers' online information. The initial attacks on Sony's PlayStation Network and online entertainment services, which put some 100 million uh, customer accounts at risk, were quick, quickly followed by still more attacks at other Sony divisions and subsidiaries. Since then, the company, to its credit, has taken some very aggressive steps to prevent future cyber attacks, such as installing new firewalls, enhancing data protection, uh, and enhancing their encryption capabilities, expanding automated software monitoring, and hiring a new chief information security officer. These are all important new safeguards, but with millions of American consumers in harm's way, why weren't these safety protocols already in place? For me, one of the most troubling issues is how long it took Sony to notify consumers and the way in which the company did it by posting an announcement on its blog. In effect, Sony put the burden on consumers to search for information instead of providing it to them directly. That cannot happen again. While I remain critical of Sony's initial handling of these data breaches, as well as its decision not to testify at our last hearing, and that goes for Epsilon as well, it's clear that since then the company has been systematically targeted by hackers and cyber thieves who are constantly probing Sony's security systems, systems for weaknesses and opportunities to infiltrate its networks. So today I'm not here to point fingers. Instead, let's point the way, a better, smarter way to protect American consumers online. As I have said, you shouldn't have to cross your fingers and whisper a prayer whenever you type in a credit card number on your computer and hit enter. E-commerce is a vital and growing part of our economy. We should take steps to embrace and protect it, and that starts with robust cybersecurity. As chairman of the subcommittee, I believe the lessons learned from the Sony and Epsilon experiences can be instructive. How did these breaches occur? What steps are being taken to prevent future breaches? What's being done to mitigate the effects of these breaches? And what policies should be in place to better protect American consumers in the future? Most importantly, consumers have a right to know when their personal information has been compromised, and companies have an overriding responsibility to promptly alert them. These re recent data breaches only reinforce my long-held belief that much more needs to be done to protect sensitive consumer information. Americans need additional safeguards to prevent identity theft, and I will soon introduce legislation designed to accomplish this goal. My legislation will be crafted around three guiding principles. First. Companies and entities that hold personal information must establish and maintain security policies to prevent the unauthorized acquisition of that data. Second, information considered especially sensitive, such as credit card numbers, should have even more robust security safeguards in place. And finally, consumers should be promptly informed when their personal information has been jeopardized. The time has, uh, has come for Congress to take decisive action. We need a uniform national standard for data security and data breach notification, and we need it now. While I remain hopeful that law enforcement officials will quickly determine the extent of these latest cyber attacks, they serve as a reminder that all companies have a responsibility to protect personal information and to promptly notify consumers when that information has been put at risk. 
and we have a responsibility as lawmakers to make certain that this happens. And now I would like to recognize uh, the vice chairman of the... Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see the ranking member, Mr. Butterfield, for his five-minute opening statement. Let me thank you, Chairman Bono Mack, for your indulgence. I've been in my office with 28 constituents, one of whom was a World War II veteran and several Vietnam veterans, and they wanted to take pictures, and, and you know that drill, and, and so I had to accommodate them as best I could. Uh, but we are here, and thank you very much for, for convening this hearing today, and I certainly thank the, the two witnesses for, for your presence. Uh, Madam Chairman, um, thank you for holding this hearing on data security and the recent breaches that we've seen at Sony and, and Epsilon. Uh, last month, well over 100 million consumer records have been compromised as a result of those breaches, including full names, email and mailing addresses, the passwords, and maybe even credit card numbers. Those two major breaches illustrate that no company is safe from attack and that we must always operate at a heightened level of security and vigilance. Uh, no company wants its data compromised, and Sony and Epsilon are certainly no exception. Uh, Sony was victim to hackers who stole nearly 100 million consumer records, and it took engineers several days to realize that there was an intrusion. During that time, hackers had full access uh, to Sony's servers. The breach that occurred at Epsilon was very large and involved the names and email addresses of about 50 of Epsilon's clients with conservative estimates of 60 million records stolen. Luckily, uh, no critically sensitive information was stolen, uh, but it easily could have. It is important that businesses do all they can, they can do to protect consumers from having their information fall into the wrong hands. For many Americans, shopping, paying bills, and refilling prescriptions, and communicating with friends and family, and even playing games are all done online. As people share more and more information online, the potential for personally identifiable information to be compromised increases exponentially. Names, physical addresses, dates of birth, social security numbers, and credit card numbers are just a few of the types of information that uh, hackers are able to access and exploit. While 46 states have laws requiring consumer notification when a breach occurs, there's currently no federal standard, no federal standard to address this. Moreover, there is no federal law requiring companies that hold PII uh, to have reasonable safeguards in place to protect this information. Without a federal standard, I am concerned that American consumers remain largely exposed online. And during the 109th Congress and, and subsequent Congresses, uh, members of this committee worked in a bipartisan fashion to develop the Data Accountability and Trust Act to address the issue of data security. Uh, the data bill, DATA bill, of the 111th Congress uh, by my friend and former chairman of the subcommittee, Mr. Rush, from Illinois, uh, would have required entities holding data uh, containing personal information to adopt reasonable and appropriate security measures to safeguard it and in the event of a breach to notify affected individuals. The data bill passed the House and the 111th Congress, but our friends in the Senate did not act. The data bill is a good foundation to improve the security of e-commerce, something that is good for consumers and good for business. It would give American consumers more peace of mind about online transactions and make them more likely to continue and expand their use of online services. And so, Madam Chairman, we have learned a lot from the breaches at, at Sony and Epsilon, and I expect to learn more today from our, our two witnesses. I want you to know that I stand ready to work with you and our colleagues to pass a strong bipartisan data security bill like the data bill that we saw in the last session. I thank today's witnesses for their testimony. look forward to, to each of you. Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. Chairman Upton yielded his five minutes for an opening statement to me in accordance with committee rules and as his designee, and I now recognize Ms. Blackburn for uh, two minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I will submit my full statement. A couple of comments. I think that the Sony and the Epsilon breaches uh, raise a lot of questions with our constituents. What they're asking us is, number one, how do you minimize identity theft? Number two, they want proper notifications from the vendors that they are doing business with. And number three, they want to see better coordination 
with law enforcement. They feel as if this is, this is missing, and I know that as we address this, what we're going to have to look at is better government coordination incentives for industry cooperation in, in this issue, stricter penalty deterrence against hackers, and a flexible framework for risk assessment and breach alerts. Um, as we do this, I hope that we will continue to look at the threat of digital protection of intellectual property. Uh, the two are interrelated, and we deserve, they both deserve attention. And I, I have to tell you, with the new music cloud services from Apple, Google, and Amazon, my concern is there that we put, that we hold everybody accountable and secure the integrity of that system. I do want to highlight that on the issue of illegal downloads and file sharing, my home state of Tennessee has just passed and signed into law a bill that puts in place penalties for this. They have made this a crime in our state, and I'm glad they did it because losing content to the rogue websites not only becomes a, an issue for the entertainment industry, but it exposes consumers to viruses, dangerous products, and increases the likelihood of data theft. So I thank you all for being here, and I yield back my time. I thank the gentlelady, and the chair recognizes Mr. Stearns for two minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, I think as mentioned uh, by the chairwoman, uh, the FTC recently reported 9 million Americans have fallen victims uh, to identity theft. Um, and I think it's sort of puzzling. A corporation as, as strong and uh, comprehensive as Sony, uh, they would, you would think, would have the ability uh, to certify that their data is secure. Uh, as recently mentioned, over 45 states have independently adopted uh, data breach notification requirement, uh, but of course there's no law on a federal basis. So uh, it's good that you folks are here so we can ask you some questions about, you know, perhaps if you know who the people were, uh, what was the uh, requirements that you set up in a corporation as, as uh, extensive as Sony, uh, and uh, do you think there's a criminal case here that should be prosecuted. So there's lots of questions, so I appreciate your coming here. Uh, as many of you know, I had a bill uh, when I was chairman of the Senate Committee that we got out of the House. Unfortunately, it did not get to the Senate, and I've introduced it with Mr. Matheson again, uh, which simply requires the Federal Trade Commission to develop uh, these regulations uh, requiring persons that own or possess electronic data to establish necessary security policies and procedures, as well as notification mechanism. So both of our witnesses today certainly have within their power uh, to provide the software, uh, the uh, data security provisions that are necessary. I think it must be puzzling to them as well as to us why this happened to them because uh, considering how sophisticated both of them are, I've had the opportunity to talk to them uh, uh, in my office. So um, it's very appreciative that you took the time to come here and talk to us and uh, we look forward to uh, your testimony. Thank you. Thank the gentleman, and the chair recognizes uh, Mr. Olson for one minute. I thank the chairwoman for her leadership in calling this timely hearing. As we all learned this morning, overseas hackers from China hacked into Google email accounts. Like Sony, Epsilon, and now Google, my home state of Texas has experienced a massive data breach in April of this year when almost 3.5 million Texans had their personal information, their names, mailing addresses, and social security numbers compromised from the office of the Texas Comptroller of Public Accounts, and it was posted to a public server. There was a clear need for government, businesses, and citizens to work together to protect citizens' personal information. Look forward to working with the chairwoman on comprehensive data security legislation. I thank the witnesses for coming, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank the gentleman, and, and uh, turn our attention to the panel. We have a, a single panel of very distinguished witnesses joining us today. Welcome. Each of you have a prepared a statement that will be placed into the record, but if you could summarize your statement uh, in your remarks, we'd appreciate it. Uh, on our panel, we have Jeanette Fitzgerald, General Counsel for Epsilon uh, Data Management, LLC, 
Also testifying is Tim Schaff, President, Sony Network Entertainment International. Good afternoon, and thank you both very much for coming. You will each be recognized, as I said, for five minutes to help you keep track of time. There's a clever little device in front of you, red, yellow, green. And uh, when the light turns yellow, please summarize as you would a traffic light. So uh, Ms. Fitzgerald, you're recognized for five minutes. And please remember the microphone and pull it close to your mouth, if you would. And sorry, excuse me, would you pull the microphone up? I think it's on. Better? Thank you. Okay. Good morning. Chairman Bonomack, Ranking Member Butterfield, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, my name is Jeanette Fitzgerald, and I'm the General Counsel for Epsilon Data Management. Thank you for inviting me to present Epsilon's testimony on data security. I hope that I can provide information today and going forward that will act as a helpful resource as you consider data security legislation that is in the best interests of both consumers and business. My full written testimony has been submitted for the record. I will summarize it here and hope to leave you with three main points. First, who is Epsilon and how do we provide important data management services for our clients? Second, how the attack of March 30th occurred and what we are doing to apprehend the perpetrators and improve our own data security. And finally, why we think national data breach notification legislation is important. Epsilon is the leading provider of permission-based email marketing services. Our clients, some of the world's largest and best known consumer and financial services brands, count on us to send their email messages to their customers, the individual consumer. And as we all know, major brands use email messages to provide consumers with timely information about new products and sales and events, among other things. Epsilon ensures that these email messages comply with applicable legal requirements, including Can Spam Act. To earn and keep our clients' trust, Epsilon became the first in the industry in 2006 to certify that its information security program complied with the standards issued by the International Association of Standardization, known as ISO. ISO, a highly regarded organization, is recognized by over 160 countries around the world, including the United States, as identifying best practices for information security management. The standards are demanding, requiring over a year to earn initial certification. We are proud that Epsilon led the industry and that we have achieved yearly recertification, which requires proof that the company is improving its security program each year. Notwithstanding our internal security procedures and our compliance with these rigorous data security standards, as you know, Epsilon was the victim of a criminal hacking incident at the end of March. Since our information security program was designed to identify and respond to attacks and threats, we were quickly able to detect the unauthorized download activity, which triggered Epsilon's security incident response program. Our investigation, both internal and with an independent third party, is coordinated closely with the Secret Service and is still ongoing. But we can say that the initial investigation confirms that only email addresses, and in some cases first and last names, were affected by this attack. Again, only email addresses, and in some cases first and last names, were affected. The details of what happened after the attack are in my written statement that has been submitted for the record. We are greatly troubled that this criminal incident has called into question our commitment to data security. But I want to leave you with four main <coughs> points about what happened and how Epsilon responded. Our first, our internal response to the criminal attack was immediate. We isolated computers and changed employee access rights. Second, our forensics investigation began within hours. We also reached out to law enforcement just as quickly. Third, notification to our clients also occurred on the same day, and we released a public statement and posted additional public information on our website shortly thereafter. And finally, now and going forward, we reiterate our commitment to working with the Secret Service, apprehending the hackers, and improving our own security. Companies like Epsilon are on the front lines in the fight against data theft. We also believe Congress has an important role to play in protecting consumers. 
To that end, Epsilon fully supports legislation that would create a uniform standard for data breach notification. The current patchwork of over 45 individual state breach notification laws is confusing. A uniform national law, on the other hand, would provide predictability and equitable protection for consumers, regardless of their state of residence. Chairman Bono Mack, Ranking Member Butterfield, and members of the subcommittee, we look forward to working with you as the legislative process moves forward. I sincerely hope that the information I'm able to provide at this hearing is helpful to the subcommittee as it considers this critical issue. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fitzgerald. And Mr. Schaff, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Chairman Bono Mack, Ranking Member Butterfield, and other distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for providing Sony with this opportunity to testify on cybercrime and data security. My name is Tim Schaff, and I'm president of Sony Network Entertainment International, a subsidiary of Sony Corporation based in California, where we employ approximately 700 people in five offices around the state. I'm chiefly responsible for the business and technical aspects of Sony's PlayStation Network and Curiosity, an online service that allows consumers to access movies, television shows, music, and video games. Sony Network Entertainment, Sony Online Entertainment, another subsidiary of Sony's, and millions of our customers were recently the victims of an increasingly common digital age crime, a cyber attack. Indeed, we've been reminded in recent days of the fact that no one is immune from the threat of cyber attack. Businesses, government entities, public institutions, and individuals can all become victims. The attack on us was, we believe, unprecedented in its size and scope. Initially, Anonymous, the underground group associated with last year's WikiLeaks-related cyber attacks, openly called for and carried out massive denial-of-service attacks against numerous Sony Internet sites in retaliation for Sony bringing in action in federal court to protect its intellectual property. During or shortly after those attacks, one or more highly skilled hackers infiltrated the servers of the PlayStation Network and Sony Online Entertainment. Sony Network Entertainment and Sony Online Entertainment have always made a concerted and substantial effort to maintain and improve their data security systems. We hired a well-respected and experienced cybersecurity firm to enhance our defenses against the denial of service attacks threatened by Anonymous, but unfortunately, no entity can foresee every potential cybersecurity threat. We have detailed for the subcommittee in our written testimony the timeline from when we first discovered the breach. But to briefly summarize, the first indication of a breach occurred on Tuesday, April 19th of this year. On Wednesday, April 20th, we mobilized an investigation and immediately shut down all of the PlayStation Network services in order to prevent additional unauthorized activity. After two highly respected technical forensic firms were retained to assist in the time-consuming and complicated investigation, on Friday, April 22nd, we notified PlayStation Network customers via post on the PlayStation blog that an intrusion had occurred. After a third forensic firm was retained, on Monday, April 25th, we were able to confirm the scope of the personal data that we believed had been accessed. And although there was no evidence credit card information had been accessed, we could not rule out the possibility. Therefore, the very next day, Tuesday, April 26th, we issued a public notice that we believed the personal information of our customers had been taken, and that while there was no evidence that credit card data was taken, since we could not rule out the possibility, we had to acknowledge that it was possible. We posted uh, we also posted this on our blog and began to email each of our account holders directly. We did not merely uh, make statements on our blog. On Sunday, May 1st, Sony Online Entertainment, a multiplayer online video game network, also discovered that data may have been taken. On Monday, May 2nd, just one day later, Sony Online Entertainment shut down this service and notified customers directly that their personal information may have also been compromised. Throughout this time, we felt a keen sense of responsibility to our customers. We shut down the networks to protect against further unauthorized activity. We notified our customers promptly when we had specific, accurate, and useful information. We thanked our customers for their patience and loyalty and addressed their concerns arising from this breach with identity theft protection programs for the U.S. and other customers around the world where available, as well as a welcome back package of extended and free subscriptions, games, and other services and we worked to restore our networks to stronger security to protect our customers' interests. Let me address the specific issues you are considering today. Notification of consumers when data breaches occur. 
Laws and common sense provide for companies to investigate breaches, gather the facts, and then report data losses publicly. If you reverse that order, issuing vague or speculative statements before you have a specific and reliable information, you either send false alarms or so many alarms that these warnings may be ignored. We therefore support federal data breach legislation and look forward to working with the subcommittee on the particulars of the bill. One final point. As frustrating as the loss of networks for playing games was for our customers, the consequences of cyber attacks against financial or defense institutions can be devastating for our economy and security. Consider the fact that defense contractor Lockheed Martin and the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, which helps the Department of Energy secure the nation's electric grid, were also cyber attacked within the past, within the past two months. By working together to enact meaningful cybersecurity legislation, we can limit, limit the threat posed to us all. We look forward to this initiative to ensure that consumers are empowered with the information and tools they need to protect themselves from cyber criminals. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Schaff. And uh, I'd like to thank both of you for your opening statements as well as for your unique insight into these disturbing data breaches. I'm confident that the lessons learned uh, will assist us in our efforts to develop new online safeguards for American consumers. I'm going to recognize myself for the first five minutes of questioning. And Mr. Schaff, um, given the extreme makeover of Sony's online security protocols, it, it does beg the question, why weren't many of these safeguards, such as having a chief security information officer, in place before the April data breaches? Uh, we believed that the security that we had in place was very, very strong, and we felt that we were in good shape. Um, however, uh, as the um, attacks indicated, uh, the intensity and sophistication of the hack was such that even despite those best um, measures that we had taken, it was not sufficient. And as we recognize moving forward that the uh, scrutiny that we're likely to be under from the hackers will continue, we've uh, made additional commitments to enhance the security of our networks. In addition, we had been working for some months now, more than 18 months, um, to expand the, both the capacity and security of our network. We're a new business, but we're a very fast-growing business. All right, let me jump ahead. Uh, sure. You indicated, or Sony, in the May 3rd letter that you contacted the FBI on April 22nd, which was two days after it determined the breach had, it had in fact occurred. Why did Sony wait two days to no notify law enforcement? Uh, my understanding is that we notified them as soon as we had something clear that we could report that indicated some sign of uh, external intrusion that would be uh, unauthorized or illegal. Your testimony indicates four servers were taken offline on April 19th before you pulled the plug on all 130 servers. Can you tell us what information was different that was stored on those initial four servers? Well, they were, um, these were par part of a larger network of machines, and we believe this was just the first entry point that the hacker may have used to get into the network. And w upon discovering them, we immediately shut them down. But there were other servers that were also uh, uh, attacked by the hackers as well. Some media reports indicate Sony's servers may not have had up-to-date patches or firewalls prior to the attack. Is that true? That's actually patently false. Uh, the Apache servers were fully up-to-date, fully patched, and in fact uh, we had um, several layers of firewalls in place, also contrary to so many of the uh, things that you may have read on the Internet. As you know, the Internet is not always a reliable source of factual information. And you state that you believe the cyber attack on Sony was uh, unprecedented in both size and scope. Can you uh, explain why you believe it is unprecedented? Well, we believe that the sophistication of the attack, the collection of activities that were undertaken, the period of time in which the hackers were carefully um, exploring the network, and then ultimately the scope of um, the, scope of the service that was breached um, makes it a re quite a remarkable attack. And despite the deep um, security measures that we had taken, it was nevertheless insufficient to guard against these attacks. Uh, was the consumer data you held encrypted? And why or why not? So, of course, the credit card information that was held was encrypted. Um, password login data was uh, uh, protected using cryptographic hash functions. And these practices are in line with industry practice. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Fitzgerald. Would greater security requirements have prevented uh, your breach? And if not, what added protection are, you, are your new uh, security measures providing? At the time, we had um, very extensive security, as I noted in, in my opening statement and the written statement I provided. 
We've continued through the investigation to evaluate additional things that may be done to strengthen um, both our networks and any of the um, access points. Um, we have also decided to hire um, some outside um, experts to even evaluate the network further and see if there's anything else in different parts of our network that need to be adjusted. Coming as a consumer who received multiple notices about your breach, uh, there are also indications that consumers re received notice of the breach from your business customers for which in some cases they hadn't had a purchase or a customer relationship for four or five years. Do you ever purge your data? And why do you hold on for information uh, for as long as you do? So let me step back a second to remind everyone how Epsilon is, um, plays in this. Epsilon is a service provider to the well-known names that you may have received notifications from, and they have the relationship with the consumer. What data we hold is determined by the client, and the client then tells us what to hold and what we then do with it in terms of sending out notices or any sort of marketing messages is entirely up to the client. It's do not you advise up. them on when it might be a good time to purge data? It's, it depends on what they want to do with the data. And there's also um, opt-out data that would have been held because in order to comply with canned spam, you have to maintain records of who has opted out. So if two years ago you opted out and you haven't had any activity, that list would still be there because you have to comply with can spam. So we have to be able to duplicate or deduplicate and take those names out any time that we do a mailing. Okay. Thank you. My time has expired. I will recognize the ranking member, Mr. Butterfield, for his five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Mr. Schaff, let me start with you, and if I have any time remaining, I'll go over to, to Ms. Fitzgerald. Uh, Mr. Schaff, I understand that your internal investigation has not turned up any evidence suggesting that credit card data was taken from the network. Uh, but to me, that doesn't necessarily mean that the data was not taken, uh, just that you haven't turned up any digital fingerprints that would allow you to know with certainty that it was taken. And, and I think you see what I'm saying there. What, help me with that. Uh, sure. to, to, to how certain are you that the data was not taken well, in the attack? As you know, we have been involved in an intensive investigation over the past six weeks since the breach occurred. And um, we have uh, looked, at, uh, looked deeply at the logs related to the databases. And in those logs, we have found no clear, um, no clear evidence that there is, um, was any access made to the credit card information. And we found um, plenty of evidence that suggests that that w data was not accessed. That's the basis for today's statements that we do not believe the credit card information was compromised. Now, in your testimony, you mentioned that the attack took place on April 19th, that the PlayStations were shut down on April 20th, and that you did something on April 22nd. Hel help me with that, if you would shed some light on what you did on April sure. 22nd. On April 22nd, yeah. we were, uh, this is the point at which we first notified consumers that there had been an intrusion. We um, were trying to understand what had happened to the network, and we were actively um, beginning the investigation of that um, breach. And at the point that we were able to determine that there had been an intrusion, we immediately notified consumers so that, we would, uh, that they would be aware of what had occurred, even though at that time we were not yet able to confirm precisely which data May, had, may have been compromised. So is it your testimony that on April 22nd you began the process of notifying the consumers? Well, we notified them on the PlayStation blog of the intrusion, but then on April 26th we followed that up with an additional notification um, regarding more specifics related to the actual data that may have been breached, and we began immediately notifying consumers starting from that date via email of the breach right. as well. But the April 22nd announcement was simply on the internet. It, it was, it was, that was posted on the on blog. The PlayStation blog. The PlayStation blog is one of the most um, active and popular blogs on the web. It's currently ranked about number 20, just behind the U.S. White, the, the White House blog. So it's a very, very uh, expected place for our consumers to look for information. Do you have any way of knowing how many consumers actually read the statement? Uh, I, do, I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. We can investigate. And but seven days after the breach, 
uh, was when official notification was issued. We were not able to determine until the, the day that we had um, notified consumers. Uh, we, we were searching for evidence that would allow us to confirm uh, the status of the credit card information. And, and you think seven days was a reasonable time? Actually, yes. what's been interesting from my perspective is that we've continued this investigation in the successive weeks, and as you hear me speaking today, some of our conclusions with respect to credit card information have, have changed somewhat from our original statements, and that, that change has occurred because of the continuing investigation. We, in the, uh, in the abundance of caution, we acknowledge the possibility that credit cards would have been taken in our announcements on the 26th, but as you can see, the, the, the situation changes as the investigation proceeds, and we felt it would have been irresponsible if we had notified consumers earlier with partial or incomplete information. But you have, based on, on your experience here, made some corrections and some adjustments in, in the credit card data that you collect. We have, we yeah. have um, been working to increase the security of the entire network, um, and additional controls related to credit card data have also been put in place, yes. And how do these measures compare to those for the other types of personal information that you have, the credit card data credit versus card, the, the credit, other information? Yes, excuse me. Yeah. The credit card information is the most highly uh, protected and guarded information. Um, it's all encrypted, and uh, so even if it's taken, it's not likely to be useful to, to the hacker. Is it true that user passwords were hashed and not encrypted? Is that That's true? true? It is true that they were uh, hashed using cryptographic hash functions. That's an uh, industry practice, which is very standard. It's not an unusual practice at all. Industry standard. Well, why don't you use any type of encryption uh, in, 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 in your procedures? It is a form, it is a form of um, protection that's very, very closely related to, to encryption, and I'm not an expert in cryptography, so I'm not sure that I could answer the question in a more detailed way. What manner. is irreversible encryption? Irreversible encryption, irreversible encryption is my understanding of the definition of a cryptographic hash. I'm sorry, this is All right. quite technical. <laughs> uh, Ms. Fitzgerald, your testimony states that Epsilon's internal investigation revealed that the login credentials of the employee who reported unusual and suspicious download activity had been compromised. In, in layman's terms, I suppose, I, I assume this means that the employee's credentials had been hijacked and used by a ha hacker uh, to carry out the intrusion into uh, your network and to steal consumers' email addresses. Can you please tell me a little bit more about what that means, uh, that the employee's login credentials, credentials were compromised? Well. What we had under understood during the investigation is that the credentials were somehow used based on the logs, though not necessarily by that person, to actually download, those log download that information. Um, what we, that's why we then immediately, our system kicked into place and immediately we saw that there was improper downloads and so our security system kicked in and then we knew that there was a problem and we shut their access down, and anybody else who had credentials at that level and, thank you. and took that computer off the system. Thank you. My time has expired. I thank the gentleman and, and uh, recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Stearns, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, let me be sure I understand, uh, Ms. Schaefer, exactly what was taken. As I understanding is emails were taken and the name of the people whose email was taken. Is that correct? I'm sorry, was that to me? What is, yes. I'm sorry. What was actually taken, as I understand it, was email it, is addresses, e emails, first, and in some cases, first, first and last names. names. Okay, and that was all? Yes. And you said that you've notified all 50 uh, to 75 customers, is that correct? There were about 50 cust customers okay. of ours, clients, okay. that were affected, and we notified them. Would you provide the committee the l complete list of those? The names of those clients are subject to agreements that we have with them, and we're supposed to keep those confidential. So you cannot so provide we notified, us? So we notified them promptly so they can... No, I know you notified, but you cannot provide the committee with these names? Is that what you're saying today? Not at this point, no. Now, I have in our material that some of these people are J.P. Morgan, Chase, Capital One, Citibank, West Buy, Best Buy, Verizon, Target, Home Shopping Network, and Verizon. Is that part of the 50 to 75? I recognize most of those names as being ones that sent out notifications. They are people that have huge number of people. So 
the impact of this 50 to 75, we cannot even comprehend how many Verizon has. So can you extrapolate, not telling us in detail, but if Verizon is one of your customers and you had a breach with the emails and name, does that mean that perhaps millions of names from Verizon have been breached? There could be um, a many. Just yes or no? I Yes, okay. Yes. Now, uh, with Sony, the question is, as I understand it, the password for the Sony PlayStation was breached. Is that correct? Well, the, we believe that there was, uh, were a number of different types of information accessed, including name, first name and last name, address, date of birth, okay. login password, login address. For the Sony PlayStation. For the Sony PlayStation network, yes. Okay, and what about their... Uh, credit cards? As I said, we had originally uh, stated that there was a possibility, we could not rule out the possibility that the credit card information had been accessed. At this point in time, we do not see any evidence okay. that it has been. When you look at the person's credit card together with personal information, his password for Sony PlayStation, would one person have all of that breached for that one person, or is it segmented so somebody got their password, somebody got their credit card, somebody got their personal, or is all this information together when it's, it was breached? It's difficult for us to know exactly which data was taken, but it is likely that they would have been taken together, but we yeah. don't know for which accounts that would have been. And what is the conservative estimate of the number that people were affected by this breach? Well, so we've announced that there were approximately 77 million accounts that could have been accessed um, when we took the network offline, obviously all of our customers were affected for the period of time that the network's been down. But that's part of the reason why we provided the identity theft insurance, identity theft protection program, and these welcome back programs was to uh, appreciate and acknowledge the, um, the loss of access to the network that our customers experienced and to address the concerns that they may have regarding um, the loss of their personal information. Is it true that you brought suit to, to protect uh, your IP against the hackers of PlayStation 3 device? Th that is true. Uh, do you, why did you bring this suit? Well, um, just like the music industry and the movie industry, uh, the PlayStation business is built upon uh, intellectual property. Content providers uh, invest millions of dollars to create titles that we then help them to distribute in our business and the employment of literally tens of thousands of people around the country. Knowing what has happened to you with this breach, would you say that uh, you would do it again? I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Knowing what has happened with this breach, would you go ahead and have done that suit again in hindsight? Well, I think it's, this is one of the great challenges right now is how do companies protect their content businesses? I mean, I think we made the right decision. Do, did it have consequences? It appears to have had some fairly negative consequences for the company. But if we hadn't done something, I think it would be playing out in a different company later on. Okay. I think this is a big issue for the Now, for the name. assuming we have federal legislation, um, do you think federal legislation to address security breaches would help? Because I understand both of you are in states where we have state legislation, and that didn't seem to necessarily force you to have a secure data security department. So why would federal legislation so I th make it better? Sure than the states were already passed and you didn't comply evidently with the states. I think well, well, actually, I think that the issue regarding the states' rights, I'm not a lawyer, I'm, let me mention right. up front, I'm not a lawyer, but my understanding here is that there are a variety of laws in a number of the states, but the laws are often in, seemingly in conflict and they can create very complicated situations for us to understand how we should behave properly with regard to notification obligations. Regarding the security of the network, I think the evidence of Epsilon, of Sony, of many other companies that have been reported in the news in the last several weeks indicates that despite spending millions of dollars to secure your networks, despite all of the best methods uh, known to us, our networks are not 100 percent protected. It's a process that requires continual investment, and we do that. But I think without additional support from the, the government, it's unlikely that we will all collectively be successful, and that will threaten the the livelihood of the internet, the growing internet uh, economy. And Thank you, much. Time has expired. The chair recognizes Mr. Guthrie for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, Chairman, and for having this com this hearing. I appreciate it very much. Uh, so, just to follow up on what uh, Mr. Stern said. The the patchwork of state laws, the the different 
state jurisdictions complicated your ability to respond? Is that, is that I, you didn't say that, but is, is that what I heard? Re I was responding specifically to the issue about the notification obligation. Right. My understanding the notification is there state are, laws there are some start. conflicting uh, obligations there. So a federal standard would be? A federal standard that would preempt the states would be extremely helpful. Okay. I'm just trying to get the, kind of the nature. So Epsilon is a vendor for you, uh, is, 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 right, Ms. a vendor for Sony. So did the hacker go to Epsilon no, actually, these into are, Sony or Sony to Epsilon to get to the other? Yeah, how sorry, did that, let how me did that clarify. work? These are actually two completely separate breach events. Okay. So the, the uh, activity at Epsilon was completely unrelated to, as far as we know, what happened at Sony. But, so you're not a vendor with Epsilon. This is two completely I'm separate. Aware. Oh, okay. But, so the other customers... Okay, I, I was thinking, I apologize. But to your other customers, they came, they, the Epsilon, they got to your system and then through your system were able to, at least the companies that you notified, the, the Verizons, the Kroger's that, we, that was mentioned earlier, that's how that breach worked. So, so as a vendor, um, and our ability to send out email addresses on behalf of those clients requires us to maintain those email addresses mm -hmm. for right. them. And that's how the um, hackers got in and got that information. Okay, okay. Um, has Sony been victim before of any type of breach? And if well, so, how did that? Uh, not to this level, I know. Or, but We, we you, certainly experience a constant level of fraud, um, and we are under uh, regular uh, probing by hackers and others. I mean, I think it's a standard part of anybody who's in the Internet business these days. And, and for both of you, too, I know I'm – manufacturing background and we did ISO 9000 which was a set of standards for quality control they have ISO 14000 or set of standards for environmental uh, and they're, they're good practices to follow but a lot, they leave a lot of interpretation to the businesses because otherwise they're formed by committee and it'd be difficult to change every time something needs to be changed I'm not familiar with this particular standard that you're talking about but is it sufficient if you follow the ISO standards to I, I guess my question is your, in, your industry is so changing, fast changing, that when you're in the automotive industry, which I am in, you put a standard in place, it takes a while for things to innovate that you, the standard is out of date. Is it, it, it appears to me when I saw ISO that it would be difficult for them to keep up with the changes in the industry or, or the changes, the, I guess what I'm saying, the ability of people who hack to, to innovate to find new ways into your system. So is this sufficient, I guess ISO being certified sufficient, you think, to... We don't use the ISO as the only thing we do. We have lots of um, audits by our clients. We have um, SAS 70 audits we have to do. And then, frankly, we have our own security program where we're continually trying to upgrade our systems and to um, make sure that we make things as, as tight as we can. But the hackers are very sophisticated. This wasn't some guy in a garage Mm -hmm. um, just coming after us. These are sophisticated guys, and I've talked to the Secret Service enough times now to know that this is, we're not the only one, and that um, they're working with the FBI, and there's a concerted effort to go after these guys. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, I would concur. I mean, I think these, these uh, guidelines and standards are important uh, for the industry to move forward, but they are far from sufficient, and if they had been sufficient, I, you know, Epsilon wouldn't be here. And I think that we are all under attack and um, without additional measures to be taken and without kind of constant renewal of our practices, it's not going to be sufficient to fight the latest, the latest attacks. Okay, thank you. Uh, I guess one thing that I'm really kind of concerned about as we move forward, I know Sony, I mean, anytime you have to spend money because somebody did something illegal, that, that's an inefficiency to everybody. And, and, but the two or three store small business in Kentucky that maintains their clients' files are, and just having the resources to be able to, to respond. Now that, that's what, to protect their clients, to protect their customers. And, and I just, do you have any estimate of how much money just these, these events are going to cost your, your firm? And hence, you know, the economy overall, because that's yeah, what I, I'm I believe I believe we've made statements publicly estimating a cost something in the range of $170 million for this particular incident. And, I, and obviously, as you, as you note, for smaller businesses, number one, the ability to secure their networks as effectively is, is less because of the economics of that. And the evidence that I've seen in various reports suggests that 
the prevalence of attacks on small and mid-sized businesses is even higher than these, uh, the, the successful attacks is even higher than we see with the larger companies. So scary situation. Well, thank you. I'm out of time, so I yield back to the chairwoman. I think the gentleman and the chair notes that we are uh, being called to the floor for votes. My intention is to try to get through two more member questioning uh, five-minute segments before we uh, recess. So the chair now recognizes Mr. Olson for five minutes. I thank the chairwoman, and again, I thank the witnesses for coming and giving us your expertise, your time today. And as, as I stated in my opening statement, my home state of Texas experienced a serious and troubling data breach earlier this year. Names, addresses, social security numbers, and in some cases, birth dates and driver's license numbers of state retirees and unemployment beneficiaries were posted unencrypted on a public server. In response, our state attorney general and the FBI have launched a criminal investigation into this data breach. Unfortunately, these kind of breaches are happening more frequently and they cost businesses tens of billions of dollars annually. The Federal Trade Commission estimates that nine million individuals in the United States have their identities stolen every year. This is the equivalent of approximately 17 identities stolen every minute. That means that during the course of this hearing, if all of my colleagues and I take up our full five minutes, 85 IDs across this country will have been stolen. In response to the Texas data breach, the Comptroller of Public Accounts launched a website called Texas Safeguard, which was created as a tool for Texans to receive uh, up-to-date information about the breach, along with recommended security steps to take. And of note, they actually put a toll-free number up for folks to call, and the Comptroller is offering credit monitoring at no charge. There's also a frequently asked questions page, which outlines six steps people can take to protect themselves. But this burden, is placed upon these victims of this breach, and they've got to spend their own time enrolling in credit monitoring, placing fraud alerts on their credit lines, credit files, requesting credit reports, and so on and so on and so on. Mr. Zero, Mr. Schaff, given the breaches your companies have experienced and all the heartache and lost revenue, all the upset customers, all the resources you had to expend to determine how these breaches occurred, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you do think that there's a clear need for a comprehensive federal data breach and notification law, one that will create a uniform standard and preempt the current patchwork of state laws. Yay, nay. I do believe that we, it would be great if we had a federal data breach notification law that did preempt all of the state um, laws so it would be straightforward and companies would know exactly what they needed to take care of and who they needed to notify and when they needed to notify. Mr. Shaw? Sony is also very supportive of such legislation, and we would be very happy to participate and help, uh, help in the formation of that legislation. Right, thank you. And, and this is for Cheryl, this is just for you, but why did you choose to contact law enforcement, the FBI and the Secret Service, as soon as you became aware of the incident? I mean, is this a typical response for Epsilon to get the law enforcement involved when a breach occurs when you don't necessarily know the extent of it? Well, we knew pretty quickly that there was, had been some data that had been downloaded and taken by somebody who wasn't authorized, and therefore it was a criminal act in our mind. And so we went to look for law enforcement, the right ones, to help us um, go after the bad guys. Okay, and uh, for you, Mr. Schaff, uh, I know you and PlayStation had one heck of a, an April. But why did you conclude that notifying PlayStation Network customers via the PlayStation blog was, as you stated, one of the best, fastest, and most direct means of communicating with customers. In the years that PlayStation has been in business, we have managed this, law, this blog, and it has become a very, very popular source of information for our customers about new game titles and all kinds of information related to PlayStation. And we know um, that it's um, a good way to get a message out to customers quickly. Of course, that wasn't the only way we communicated with our customers. We did follow up with public announcements through other channels, uh, as well as email, direct email uh, to the consumers uh, following the breach. Okay, one final question about sort of how you're prepared for this. Uh, I mean, I know, Mrs. Fitzgerald, for your testimony, uh, Epsilon had, very, uh, had reactive plans in place ready to go if some sort of breach happened, and I assume that's the same for Sony. Absolutely. But, uh, I mean, is there a specific entity within both of your companies that's proactive? I mean, somebody you've got in your company that sort of looks at your security system and tries to penetrate penetrated, tries to find the weaknesses, I mean, sort of a proactive approach instead of 
reacting to a breach, preventing a breach by recognizing weaknesses within the company? I mean, a successful approach to security involves both proactive as well as reactive uh, approaches, and we definitely have those kinds of resources in place in my company and in Sony Corporation as a whole. That's Thank an important you. part of our, of our process. And I would agree with that also. Epsilon has that. Okay, I see I'm down to 16 seconds. I thank the witnesses again for your time. And uh, uh, at the risk of uh, getting crosswise with the chairwoman and well, Mr. Stern's left, but go Mavericks. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, chair recognizes Mr. Harper for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I would ask uh, you, Mr. Schaff, why did it uh, take so uh, Sony approximately seven days to notify customers that their personal data had been compromised? Well, the, the, the basic essence here was to find the right balance between notifying customers as soon as we had some sense that something had gone wrong, but not being irresponsible in that notification and creating undue stress or concern within the customer base. We immediately began an investigation, and we were able to notify customers within a couple of days that we had had an unauthorized external intrusion. But it took us several more days to be able to clearly discern what information had been taken. And even at that point, we were not, a, uh, not able to rule out the possibility that credit card information had been taken. Nevertheless, we went ahead and, and made a public statement uh, regarding those, those losses, the potential of those losses. All right. I, I just want to be clear. So how long was it before any customers got notification? It was uh, the, the we first discovered unusual activity on the 19th. We shut down the network on the 20th of April, and we notified consumers on the 22nd of April. Okay. And did, that, did you notify that. all the consumers at that point? Well, so at that point, we were intensely involved in this investigation to try to mm -hmm. figure out what to notify the customers about. Um, and so at that time, we notified, utilizing the blog, that the intrusion, that we believed there had been an intrusion, and then beginning on the 26th, when we made a lot of um, public announcements related to specific information that may have been lost, we initiated uh, through the news channels, obviously our blog, as well as through a direct email campaign to the customers, uh, detailed information about the nature of the loss. How many notifications did each uh, consumer receive? Well, uh, my understanding is that in regard to the Sony, uh, the PlayStation breach, that should have been approximately 77 million emails that were sent. I understand, but were they notified more than one time as you learned additional information? Um, well, we had notified via the blog on the 22nd. We, had notif we, had, we provide updates uh, on that blog on a regular basis as to kind of the concurrent state of affairs, mm -hmm. um, but I believe in terms of the email notifications related to the potential loss of data, that was a, a one-time event. Do you believe the, uh, the news that you passed on, was that done, looking back now, do you believe it was done quickly enough? What I would say is that we tried very, very hard to find the right balance there, um, and I believe that if we had responded earlier, it would have probably been irresponsible. Um, even to this day, we question whether we should have um, taken a little bit more time to finish the investigation with regard to the credit card information. I believe we probably struck the right balance, but it was a tough call. And, and I know there was a letter that was sent out on May 3rd where you had indicated that there was no evidence of misuse of the customer's personal information that was accessed uh, during that breach. We're a month past that point. Is that still your uh, position on we are, that? We are still, the, when we talk to the credit card companies, they have still told us that they see no signs of unusual activity related to this breach. And do you know where the attacks originated? At, unfortunately, at this time, we don't. Okay. I mean, we're working with law enforcement and others to try to figure that out, but at this time, we don't have any, any clear. Of course, you know, we uh, certainly hear media reports or speculation, and I know you don't have it with any certainty, but uh, there was one report that initially suggested that uh, Amazon's uh, pay-for-use cloud service uh, may have been used. Is there any accuracy to that or well, any proof so of that? What I, what I know is the, the FBI is investigating the, that report, and at this time I don't have any, uh, other, any other information about okay. what that, whether that's true or not. Now, did this uh, Sony Online Entertainment and Sony Network Entertainment, are they using uh, the same server models and security protections uh, and the software? We comply with the same types of uh, industry practices and the t are subject to the same policies as far as uh, being a part of the Sony Corporation. The specific architecture of each of those services is probably different because the types uh, of services that we provide are different. 
Um, but, you know, across the industry, most Internet service providers are building their services out of largely the same basic components. Thank you. So there's probably a lot of commonality there. Madam Chair, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank the gentleman. And uh, at this point in time, we're going to recess the committee to head over to the floor for vote, and our intention is to return uh, as soon after we can from the series of votes. Should, should be about 45 minutes is, is my guess. Things could change. So the subcommittee stands recess uh, until after the last vote on the floor. Thank you. Thank you. I, uh, the subcommittee will reconvene and come to order, obviously. Um, I wanted to thank you very much for indulging us and apologize that there's been a slight little change of plans with the uh, minority headed over to the White House. We're in a very important meeting with the President. Uh, we agreed that we would conclude questions. But before I do that, I'd like to offer the two of you the opportunity to give us any final thoughts you might have and any recommendations for legislation as we move forward in the process here. So I'll recognize each of you for uh, five minutes to do that. If, and you don't have to take the full five minutes if you'd like, but the time is yours if you would like it. Thank you. Um, honestly, as, as we've thought about this, we would greatly appreciate the opportunity to work with you and your staff and any members of your subcommittee to create a national data breach notification standard. The details within it would have to be worked out as we think through what would be all the ramifications. And I think clearly I would not be the only one with experience, um, but we would love to work to, with that on you. Bishoff. Thank you. Um, I want to thank you again for the opportunity to come and speak today, and especially thank you for all the work you've done related to intellectual <clears throat> property protection. This is a really critical part of the, the work we're trying to do to build and grow our business. Um, as you heard in our testimony today and, and uh, in the private session where we shared more technical details regarding the breach uh, yesterday, um, despite taking uh, what we believe to be extremely appropriate and, and substantial steps to build a, a safe and protected network, hackers were able to get into the network. Um, the thing that's frightening about this is that it's uh, easy to focus on Sony and, and uh, uh, look at the things that we might be able to do in the future to strengthen our network. The reality is because we are all building our networks out of the same basic ingredients, if there's a weakness in the way that we've built things, chances are there, the weaknesses may lie in the components that we rely on um, from the variety of vendors that we all build our products out of. And I think that um, we're working together as industry to try to strengthen our processes and our practices and our technologies. But I think the conclusion that I would leave you with today is that without further assistance from uh, the government, I think that we're all going to have a world of hurt in, the, in this Internet economy, and we really would uh, appreciate and uh, request your assistance. And regarding the specific legislation, we are also extremely supportive of this and would, would welcome the opportunity to contribute and uh, speak to you further regarding its development. Thank you. Well, I, I thank you both very much. And, Mr. Schaff, I'd also like to address a comment earlier about the uh, question of would you or would you not file suit again to protect our intellectual property, and I wanted to commend you on your answer, and uh, I'm glad that you did it then. And, uh, I, you know, too often people are afraid of uh, being hacked and the retribution because of the decisions you make. It can and, be a lonely place. <laughs> well, I want to applaud you for that. And again, I thank you both very much for the spirit with which you came before us today and the spirit of cooperation. I think the committee is very excited about the opportunity to work with you and, and craft good legislation. So um, we have a unique opportunity now as a subcommittee to make certain that in the future cyber attacks on American consumers will never again be a silent crime. So at this point, I'd like to remind all members they have 10 business days to submit questions for the record, and I ask witnesses to please respond promptly to any questions they receive. And the hearing is now adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.